Let's get started on our last lecture before spring break. All right. Um, I, I had some folks ask, when's the homework due on Friday? I said, put it on the cart. Um, let me ask this. Is anybody really going to be here the Friday afternoon before spring break working on this homework assignment? No. It's so I think you should make it till 2 o'clock. What's that? It's so close to break. Well, I mean, are you going to wait till 5 o'clock before spring break? To I might need to. I don't, I'm not going in there. Have you started it? No. <laughs> Do you have two hours free? Uh, all right, all right, all right. Hold, hold, hold. I, I mean, I'm thinking, like, I was thinking 12. I've got folks saying, well, we want till 5. What if I compromise? I heard 2. So that's my first class at 5 a.m. Are you going to wait till the... I might not. 30 homework assignments under my door. We're going to go with two. I'm fine with two. I think that's reasonable. It's, it's, you have an extra hour because you're not in class, so you can be working on it then. So we're going to go with two o'clock. That's what we're doing. It's spring break. I might not be here that long. Okay. All right. Homework 6 is due on the cart Friday, March 16th at 2 p.m. Now, I'm going to uh, raise a hint because I, I, um, I, ha I had some students ask about problem number 3. I had some emails about it. Um, I figured just go ahead and address this here. Um, I had mentioned that you can have some equations and some... Uh, responses yield some values that don't make much sense. For instance, I think one of the x distances on problem number three comes out negative, right? And I'm sure you're looking at it going, what's going on with this? But my advice to you, I'm not going to tell you what it means. I'm not going to tell you the answer. What I am going to do is give you a hint, okay? My advice to you is to do this. I want you to compute that value are you the reaction, the maximum shear, not the U star? I want, I want, we're just keeping this simple. I want you to tell me what the absolute maximum shear on the entire beam is, V max. And then compare that with VVC. Just think about it. Ignore the X distance equations and all that stuff. Just think about it. Just use your noggin. Compare are you the maximum shear and VVC. And if you look at those two values and just think about it, and, and specifically think about it in terms of your three regions of, of shear on the beam, you know, the shear's less than half of VVC, it's between VVC and half of VVC, and, and so on and so forth. If you think about it, I think you will find that this problem is simpler than you realize. Um, I'm not saying any more than that. No, that's not what I said. That's not what I said. I, no, no. I, sa I said that. I said that in instances where you might have two shear equations. You don't have that for this problem. No, no, no. That's not what's going on with this problem. Just if you look at those two values and just think about it for a little bit, I think you will find that your resulting design is actually quite simple. No, it has, no, it has nothing to do with using the wrong equation for your shear diagram because there's only one equation for your shear diagram. That, that problem just has a concentrated load at mid-span and a distributed load. So the shear diagram, it just goes up, it slopes down, and then bam. So if you're only looking at half the beam, there's only that one line. But that's not the issue. So. 
So, yeah. Bless you. If it's mirrored, which is the case for these problems. If it wasn't mirrored, then you'd have to look at all of them. But you'd have, you would not be laying out stirrups for just half the mean. You'd have one series of layouts, you know, this way, and one series of layouts this way. So you'd, you'd sort of have, you'd have, go ahead. No, I mean, like, if you had, let's say you had a 30-foot long beam, and you had a concentrated load 10 foot over, you'd have to do two stirrup layouts, one from this way, this way, and one this way. So you'd have, it wouldn't be as simple as just multiplying it by two. You'd have layout for the whole thing. Yes, for the total amount of stirrups in the beam. Yes, yes. What do you want for the final? The total number of stirrups? You want what by the layout? I want the layout. The layout. So like one at two inches, so many at whatever, and so on and so forth. So that's the answer. Is the actual layout? Yes. Okay. I, that's a good question. I would probably have a stirrup spacing increment straddle that that load. So, for instance, if I had four inch spacing, I'd probably lay it out. So here's the point, and then I'd have two inches and two inches. So I'd have stirrup straddling it. I probably wouldn't put a stirrup at the point. But we're talking about specifics, and I'd, it, it would depend on the problem and the shears and so on and so forth. Generally, I'd have one straddle it, though, or I'd make sure that the load fell in between stirrups. That's probably what I would do. Does that make sense? Well, in the end, in the end you have to think about it like this. The stirrups aren't like, they're not meant to bear on the load. That's not what they're doing. Remember, the beam cracks at a 45 degree angle. The point is to just have enough stirrups within that crack. That, that's sort of the point. So at that shear location, so if you have like a reaction here and a load here and it's shearing, it's going to crack in between. So really what matters is having those stirrups in that region. Does that make sense? But yeah, I would probably have one straddle it. So that's, that's pro it's usually what, what you would do with support reactions anyway. It's like where you start one at two inches over, you can have one on the back end if you have a little bit of the beam trailing out. That's a good question, though. Anything else? As, as, I, I hope most people have started the homework. I hope. Two o'clock on Friday. Two o'clock on Friday. All right. Okay. So today, our, our main purpose of discussion today is to set the groundwork for what we do when we get back from spring break. We're a little ahead on the schedule. Um, I was planning. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I was planning on waiting until. Uh, we got back from spring break to discuss deflections, but since we're here, I figure this is a, a good place to at least have an intro discussion. Now, when we discuss deflection, there's going to be some terms pop up we haven't seen in a while. Okay, one of them is cracking moments. Okay, now I, I made a a little bit of a joke before class. I said, you know, before when we covered cracking moments, we were covering them just to kind of give you an understanding of what a beam goes through from zero load all the way up until failure. But now they sort of have a purpose. Now cracking moments are going to fulfill a specific purpose uh, in our calculations. Um, they're, they're going to be used ultimately along with a transformed uh, moment of inertia. You all remember this, right? Where you take the steel and you turn it into an equivalent lump of concrete uh, once the beam has surpassed its cracking moment. You all remember that? Okay, well we're gonna use uh, cracking moments, and I, we're going to term it a cracked moment of inertia. It's no different than a transform moment of inertia. But we're going to use these two values um, very specifically when we compute deflections. Okay? Um, so today, we're going to probably start into example 15, but most of what we do is going to be um, a, a lot of recap 
uh, with cracking moments and transform uh, moments of inertia. But I think this is a good exercise for today so that when we get back from spring break, it's not like, oh, man, we haven't done this in a while. No, we, we, we've just done it right before break. Okay, so let's talk about functions. Now, I'm going to throw a term at you right off the bat, uh, and this term is serviceability, okay? Now, um, up until now, what we've really been focusing on in this course are strength limit states. And what I mean by strength limit states uh, are essentially limit states where we've been factoring the load. You know, we've been doing, what, 1.2 times the dead and 1.6 times the live. Now, let's think about this in our heads. Why, why do we do that? Why do we take the dead load and bump it up 20% and the live load and bump it up 60%? Well, we do that be, because of uncertainty, right? Remember, we're, we're less certain about the live load than we are the dead load, so we bump it up higher. But let's take it a step further. Why do we do this? Why do we take the load and bump it up 60% and, and the dead load up 20%? The reason is, is because up until now, bless you, up, up until now, we've been looking at factored moments and factored shears because what we're talking about is a strength limit state. In other words, if we start violating phi mn greater than or equal to mu or phi vn greater than or equal to mu, we're talking about the beam collapsing. We're talking about the beam failing. We're talking about if we're designing a bridge and we violate that limit and our grandma drives over that bridge and grandma's in the river. That's what we're talking about, which is why we take the loads and we bump them up, because we're talking about safety. Okay? So a strength limit state is, is, is concerned about ensuring that the structure is safe enough, is safe enough to adequately carry the loads. That's why we do that. Okay? That's a strength limit state. A service limit state, that's not, that's not what we're looking at. Okay, a service limit state is really more intended to ensure that the structure meets day-to-day -day performance, just regular old everyday use. You know, we want to make sure that the structure doesn't deflect too much under strength limit state. Some other things that we'll look at are vibration and maybe even cracking and things like that. Because of that, because service limit states are really not intended for safety. We're not we're not looking at this from a safety standpoint. We're just looking at it from a regular old day-to-day -day performance. One of the things that I, I guarantee you, there's going to be people that, 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 that forget this, but I'm, I'm going to tell you this now. When we're checking service limit states, i.e. when we're checking deflections, and this is true for buildings, this is true for bridges, and so on and so forth, when you're checking deflections, you don't use load factors. You don't use 1.2 times the dead and 1.6 times the live. You just add them up because we're not talking about safety. You know, if a if a beam violates phi mn greater than or equal to mu, the beam is failing and people are, are, are going to die. If the beam deflects too much, well, it just sags a little bit. Like, seriously, that's it, okay? I mean, it sucks. We obviously don't want it to happen. And in many cases, it can govern our design, but it's not a, a, a life-threatening situation. So we're not bumping that load up uh, for safety considerations. Does that make sense? So right off the bat, when we start doing deflection calculations, no load factors. We don't do 1.2 dead and 1.6 live. We just take the dead and live and we add them up. Okay? So that, 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 that's point one. If you all remember, I think it was, bless you, I think it was uh, problem two on your first exam, that cracking moment problem. If you go back and look at it, I said don't apply load factors. Now, I, I put that out there just because that's how I wanted that problem to be done. But that problem was a cracking moment problem. And I said don't apply load factors because you're going to see why, because cracking moments are going to show up in deflections. That's sort of one of the, in a very, very indirect way, prepare you for, for what's coming with this. So no load factors uh, for deflections. OK. Now, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about deflections. Um, you remember last semester, uh, we did an a, a instructional analysis. We used a, a method called moment distribution. We used that to analyze indeterminate beams, ones that were really, really highly indeterminate. And by now, you all probably use that, or a similar method in hydraulics, right, from a guy named Hardy Cross, where you have flows and pipe networks and you iterate it. Remember, moment distribution and, and flow and pipe networks, it's the same thing, you know? One respects equilibrium and one respects flow continuity, but it's the same. It, the, the mathematical principles are very, very similar. Um, the reason why I bring up Hardy Cross is because he had a very, very famous quote about structural engineering. And he said, 
that strength is essential and otherwise unimportant. And what he meant by that is this. Um, when you're designing a, uh, a beam, let, let's, let's say you're designing a reinforced concrete beam. Um, up until now, everybody in this room knows that if I give you a beam and it's 20 foot long and it's got some distributed load on it or whatever, everybody in this room could size the beam, pick an appropriate amount of reinforcement, not, not just from a moment standpoint, but from a shear standpoint. And with enough iterations and playing around with it, you could probably design a beam for strength standpoints that, from a strength standpoint, that has a 99.9% .9 efficiency or whatever. Good. Great. Wonderful. Now let's talk about deflections. Deflections are not a strength limit state, they're a service limit state. And what you might find is you've got this perfectly tailored, adequately designed beam that works perfectly from a strength standpoint, and then deflections happen, and you find that it's deflecting too much. Okay? So now you're having to take that beam and make it larger, not from a strength standpoint, but from a service standpoint, from a deflection standpoint. A lot of times in structural engineering situations, um, you'd be surprised how deflections and service limit states can actually govern the design. You have buku amounts of strength and you're totally fine on strength and it's the deflections that are governing your design. That happens a lot in highway bridge design. A lot of times you have bridges out there that have you know, more than enough strength capacity and the size of those beams and the size of those elements are governed by their L over 800 live load deflection limit. You'd be surprised. Um, so you know, nowadays, um, you know, it, it's, it's 2018. You know, we've got, uh, we're, we're, we're doing a lot better uh, with the development of our, you know, materials. I mean, nowadays, you know, we can spec out uh, concrete and steel to, to meet the, uh, the specific, you know, strength requirements that, that, we, that we specify. I mean, everybody in here, or at least most everybody in here, either already had uh, civil engineering materials from this absolutely horrible professor last semester, or they're going to have it next semester. Yeah, I, I, yes. There's, I know there's some folks that want to beat him up when they try, drive down the, uh, the alleyway back here. So you got my back. <laughs> oh, goodness. I forgot about that and so I started talking about it. Oh, that was an interesting day. Um, moving on. <laughs> but, but nowadays, uh, but the point I'm making is um, we've gotten to a point now where we've got these really, really high strength materials that, that – um, that, that allow us to design more and more slender and more and more sleek elements. But the downside is that the, the more and more slender that your element gets, the lower your moment of inertia is. And you all remember from structural analysis, when you're computing a beam deflection, there's two values that, that matter for the beam. You need a modulus of elasticity and you need a moment of inertia, right? Remember EI? So if your, BIM, if your member gets more and more slimber, uh, slender, I drops down, and if your eye gets smaller, your deflections go up. So a lot of times, deflections can govern your design more than you would um, you would think, and, and we have to be able to control those uh, those deflections. Now, let's go back to structural analysis and make sure everybody remembers just quite exactly how we compute deflections. So first off, everybody in this room should be fine with the principle of virtual work, right? Remember, you have your real moments and your virtual moments. You put your one kip load where you're determining deflection. Y'all remember that? Oh, well, we're not doing we're not doing any trusses in here though. So it's mostly beams and frames. So what's that? Oh god. Oh goodness. Now one one thing to point out: um, those design aids that I gave you all at the beginning of the semester. Yeah, they have shears and deflection or shears and moments, but they also have formulas for deflections. So, for instance, if you have a beam with a concentrated load at mid-span, you can compute the deflection at mid-span as PL cubed over 40 ADI. All right, now, y'all got to be careful on units. What's your deflection conversion factor? Anybody remember that? Your deflection unit conversion factor. 17, 1728, right? Remember you got cubic feet to cubic inches? Oh, man, that's bringing it back, isn't it? Now, you can just input everything in consistent units, like you can use your length as 480 inches instead of, you know, 40 feet. You can do that. Just make sure that you're aware. Okay. Now, here's where things get complicated. Okay. I would say that if there's, um, if there's one sort of general mistake that students make when they do deflections is that they, fa they factor loads. 
But if there's one conceptual point that students really don't understand the first time that they start calculating deflections for reinforced concrete, it's this. Okay? So what I've got here on, on the screen is I got an image of a, be a simply supported beam. And let's say that beam is subjected to a uniformly distributed load. Would you all agree that the moment diagram, if it's got a uniformly distributed load on it, looks something about like this? Right? Okay. Now, <laughs> let's take that beam and then let's compute the cracking moment. Okay? So how do we calculate the cracking moment? Remember, it's FR times IG divided by YT. Remember that? Okay. So let's say here's the beam and the cracking moment is right there. Okay? Looks to me that if I'm looking at this moment diagram as a whole, there are some regions of this beam where the bending moment exceeds the cracking moment and some regions where it doesn't, right? So if I'm computing the deflections on this beam, really what I would be concerned with is something like that. Because look at this beam. With this beam, some of the beam is cracked, some of it isn't, right? So what is the moment of inertia? It's not as simple as just BH cubed over 12, because BH cubed over 12 will work great here, but it won't work great here, because here we'd be using what? That transform moment of inertia, where you take the steel and you transform it into an equivalent lump of concrete. Y'all remember that? So what do you use? Okay, a lot of our formulas assume a uniform moment of inertia across the entire beam. So what do you use? Do you use the gross moment of inertia? Do you use the cracked moment of inertia? Or do you use somewhere in between? The answer is somewhere in between. Enter this. This is the effective moment of inertia. So if you want an explanation as to what the effective moment of inertia is, it's sort of a weighted average between the gross moment of inertia and the transform moment of inertia, depending upon the magnitude of your moment. So if you look at what goes into the expression, we've got the cracking moment and the applied moment goes into this. No service load. No service load. Okay? No service load. Oh, no service load. No load factors. When I say no service load, plenty of service load. No load factors. Sorry. So cracking moment and applied moment. So no load factors. Make sure you're aware of that. So what goes into this equation is the cracking moment and the amount of moment that's on the beam. And then the gross moment of inertia and the cracked moment of inertia or the transformed moment of inertia. And if you look at the formula, it's a lot like a weighted average. Like there's a pile of junk times IG plus a pile of junk times I transformed or I cracked. So it's like, it's not the gross moment of inertia. It's not the cracked moment of inertia. It's somewhere in between. It's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay. That part is the easy part. Here is what really tends to, uh, to, to, bug, to bug students. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go to this next slide here in a second, but I want to ask you a question. All right. What load must all beams be able to withstand? Self-weight. So here's another way of asking that. Don't beams always see some amount of dead load on them, right? Okay, here's another question. Do beams ever see live load alone, just live load? No. There has to be dead load with it, exactly. So if we want to talk about load cases on a beam, there's the dead load, then there's the dead load plus the live load. There's never the live load by itself. Make sense? Now, this is something that we never really concern ourselves with in steel design. The reason why is because steel beams don't crack. We don't have this problem in steel design. See, deflections are much more difficult to compute in reinforced concrete design than they are in structural steel design because reinforced concrete beams crack. Okay? All right? Reinforced concrete beams crack, so we have different moments of inertia. See, here, here's, here's the, the, the long and short of what we're talking about. Um, let's talk about the factors. Okay, so we've got dead loads and we've got live loads. Now, more often than not, 
we can account for dead load deflection through a process called cambering. How many of you have heard of cambering? Have I mentioned cambering in here before? Okay. If, if, I, uh, if I haven't, then just bear with me. Okay. So here's what cambering is. Okay. Let's say that I cast a beam, that I cast the beam perfectly flat. Okay, so that, that's my best flat beam that, that you're going to get out of. Okay, what's the first load that the beam will always see? What's self-weight? Okay, so, so let's say that it's got its dead load on it, right? The load that's always there, the permanent load, the load that doesn't go away. Would you agree that that beam is going to deflect some? Make sense? Let's give it a number. Let's say that that deflects one and a half inches, okay? Now, what we do in cambering is this. We actually cast the beam. We cast the beam with a little bit of upward curvature. So this is going to be exaggerated, but a cambered beam would be cast something like this, okay? Now, that is greatly exaggerated. We're talking, I mean, we're talking about a beam that, you know, in bridges, you might have a beam that's 60, 70 feet long and it's cambers like that. Like, we're talking about really, really small amounts. But, but I'm, I'm doing that so that everybody can sort of see what I'm talking about. What I will do is I will cast that beam so it has a little bit of upward curvature, okay? And let's say I cast it with an upward curvature of one and a half inches so that once I put that dead load on there, once the dead load is on it, what's the beam look like? It sits flat. It sits level. Okay? Here's my point. We can get around dead load deflection with cambering. We can't really get around live load deflection as easily because live loads are variable. They move around all the time. But the problem, we need a live load deflection. So we have to be able to compute a live load deflection. But the problem is beams never see live loads by themselves. So th this is the rub. Here, here's how we have to go about this. Okay, I'm going to go back to the previous slide. So we'll go right here. So the first case we're going to see, we're going to see just dead load. Right? Okay. That dead load, what can we do with that dead load? We can compute an applied moment, right? Once we have all the properties of the beam, we take that applied moment and we get a moment of inertia. We take that moment of inertia and then we can then compute the dead load deflection. Everybody with me on that? Now watch this. Then our next case is the dead load plus the live load, right? What does that cause our MA to do? We'll have more moment, right? If we have more moment, if we have more applied moment, do we have the same moment of inertia? No. We have a different moment of inertia. The moment of inertia changes. So we then get a new moment of inertia. And then we then compute a new dead load plus live load deflection. See, we can't compute live load deflection directly, but we can compute it indirectly. Because we can take the deflection of the beam before we put the live load on it, the deflection after we put the live load on it, and we take the difference. We can't just use the live load by itself because we wouldn't be using the right moment of inertia. Does that make sense? And the only way to, to go about that is to go through and compute it directly. So we don't have this problem in steel design because steel beams don't crack. But in concrete design, they do. See, again, the, for, at the very beginning, the beam already has dead load on it, so it's got some cracking. When you put live load on it, you're putting more load on it. That causes more cracking. Different moment of inertia, so you can't, your deflections have to be computed separately. So when you compute deflections in reinforced concrete beams, you can't compute just the live load deflection. You have to compute the, de uh, the, the deflection due to the dead load, then the deflection due to the dead load plus the live, and take the difference. I know that's a really odd idea, but because of the cracking, I think if you think about it, that'll follow. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions about that? 
That's the one concept I, I, I've noticed in reinforced concrete design that everybody's like, why can't we just compute the live load deflection directly? Well, it's because the beam cracks with more and more load. With more and more load, the moment of inertia changes. You can't use the same moment of inertia, and that's what makes it challenging. Make sense? Any questions? It's a great question. The reason why, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. The reason why is this. Dead load deflection we can handle. Okay, We can handle dead load deflection with cambering. Live load deflection, more often than not, we really can't. It's going to happen. Okay, We're going to take that live load deflection and compare it against the maximum. What are the allowable limits? Everything deflects. It's just a matter of what's allowable. So what we have to be able to do is compute a live load deflection and compare that against what's allowable. Okay. Now, what's going to get a little more intricate, and we'll, we'll take this, we'll, we'll handle this over or after we get back from spring break, but what's going to get a little interesting is those limits are also dependent upon whether or not we're talking about immediate live load deflections versus long-term live load deflections, or long-term deflections. And what I mean by that is if you have a reinforced concrete beam and you put some load on it, it'll deflect. Now take that same load and leave it on there for five years. It will continue to deflect. You know, concrete's properties will change over time. So being able to compute immediate or instantaneous deflections and long-term deflections is a whole other thing, but that's after spring break. Right now is more just making sure everybody kind of has an idea of what I'm talking about and let's get into some calculations we haven't done in a while. Does that make sense? So we will, that, that answer, that question will be computationally answered more in depth when we get back. Yeah. No, but, but they're bent upwards, right? They're bent upwards for a specific reason. They have, think, think about how they design those, okay? Those beds are designed to withstand a certain allowable load, right? When that load sits down, they sit flat. Why is that important? Well, those trucks going down the road, what happens when they go down the road and they drive, you know, uh, you know, they drive and there's some clearance issue. Now they know that their load's at least somewhat sitting flat. But yeah, the same principle, same principle. We do the same thing for steel design. We, I mean, we do that, that that's a very common practice in structural engineering in general, is to fabricate the element so that once it is installed and in place, it sits level. That is a very common process. And you want to talk about something that gets really tough and really complicated. What happens when you have a bridge that's curved and skewed and, 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 and all sorts of weird geometries? How do you sit it and put it together and then put the concrete deck on it so when it's all said and done, it sits where it needs to sit? Like that is that is really intricate. And in, in bridge engineering, in particular in steel bridge engineering, that gets real tough real quick because um, if you have members that don't fit together the way that they should, you can have locked in forces into your elements just because of the fact they don't fit together. I mean, I mean everybody in here has probably put something together and you've had some piece and you've had to shove the thing apart to get it in there. Well, think what's happening. You're shoving that thing apart. You're locking force into that member. Now, it's one thing if you're putting together a bookcase. It's another thing if you're putting together a 450-foot span bridge and you're talking about forces that are 20,000, 30,000 pounds, you know, just lock stuff in. Take that and add it to what the bridge is seeing over at Service Life. We're talking about a big deal here. So that gets real interesting real quick. So I'm calling on What you see the landscape? What do you, what do you mean? Like, uh, if one side of the bridge, for example, is at a low elevation, like you stand up here, like that's on the one side. Okay. Um, do we still want to go for a positive change of velocity? I, I'm going to give you an answer that's a little more generalized. Ultimately, what you're going to have, what you're going to have to look at it, is, is a little more generally. You're going to have sort of a before and after, and you just need to ask yourself, 
what form does the beam need to take in order to accommodate the final geometry. Now you're talking about some, you're talking about a very specialized case. In general, I think the beam is still going to need to be cambered upward because whether or not it's sitting like this or sitting like that, it's still generally being deflected downward by those dead loads. Your cambers may be affected a little bit, but not a lot. Now what can get real interesting is what's called differential deflection. You want to give yourself a headache. This will give you a headache. All right. This will make a bridge engineer cry. Okay. Let's say, let's say you have a bridge where I'm looking at it from the helicopter. You know, here's your abutment on one side, and so you've got the beams going like this, right? What happens when your other abutment is like this? So each beam has a different span length. Each beam has a different span length, so each beam has different deflection. So how do you fit that bridge together? That will make a bridge engineer cry. And, and what most bridge engineers, engineers will do is they will take a bulldozer and they will cut all this earth out right here and just make the whole bridge longer. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, you want to talk about you want to talk about generally making the project quicker and easier and ultimately cheaper. That's generally the best answer. So. So my question is to you: what, What's the difference between either a steel beam or a concrete beam in the strength of ground? Or I mean, generally, I, I would say it's probably the economy of the building. But how does is it an economy thing, or is it is it certain situations you just deem it like blank in, in certain? Oh, well, you'll you'll be you'll probably be able to answer that question next semester or next oh, yeah. year. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's a. We're talking about a, a really, really big question, yeah. but I, I might be asking you, you that, that next semester or next year. <laughs> I'm not finished. <laughs> um, <laughs> let, let me say this. It's not as simple as just dollar figures. It's time. Right. Um, it's lead time. You know, there's something to be said about lead time. You know, how long is it going to take to procure a steel beam versus a, a pre-stressed concrete element? There's geography. You know, if your bridge is, uh, is able to be accessed by a fairly straight road as opposed to a road that goes like this, that's going to affect the maximum shipping length for your element, which is going to affect whether or not you go with steel or concrete. There's also curvature, skew, just span length in general. It, it's it's a loaded question, you know. Um, um, now, let me say this. In simple situations, what you ought to do is, if, it, if it's a straightforward project, then you're probably going to know. Like, if you've got, if, if you tell me you're designing a, a, a bridge that has a, simple, that because of clearance requirements and, and issues, has a simple span of 240 feet. I'm going to tell you it needs to be a steel bridge. Just based on the spans, based on the geometry, there's no other answer. Okay? But if you're telling me that the span is 120 feet, and then you, you know, that changes things a little bit. Like, you know, depending upon the span arrangement, that, that can change things. But then you say, okay, now it's here, so now we've got curved roads, or now we've got this, or now we've got curvature and skew. If it's that complicated, you may just need to rough out some designs of both bridges and compare them and then move forward from there. It's called alternatives. So. Yep, that is, that's a unique one. Um, it's surprising that, in all honesty, that bridge is surprising that it went concrete. It really is. Um, now, there's something to be said about the fact that it's a signature bridge. Like, it's unique. Um, because it's unique, that there, there is some of that going into it. Like, if you're going to spend that much money on a bridge, why not make it cool? <laughs> 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 no, no, I'm, I'm, be, I'm being facetious, but... Um, uh, there, there is some level of like prototype and, and uniqueness to a structure like that. Um, in an everyday situation, that bridge would have gone steel. There were some unique circumstances that caused that bridge to go concrete. Um, it, 
in segment. Oh, you, well, you couldn't have done that with steel anyways. Yeah. 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 I mean, for, for bridges of that span, like, I mean, it, 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 you got to understand, that is a very odd geometry. It's really long, and it's it's got some curvature to it. That is a, it's a very... And it's got some super to it. It's a very unique structure. So um, that bridge probably had a boatload of alternatives assessed before they found the one that worked. And that's a one-off. Like, what happened on that project, you wouldn't be able to take that design philosophy and say, well, we'll just use that everywhere because that wouldn't work, you know. That's like saying, well, what, what they did on the Golden Gate Bridge, we'll just do that everywhere. <laughs> yeah. But bridge, you also have to understand, bridges like that have their own, like, line items assigned to it, like their own maintenance line items and their own, you know, budget assigned to it because they're so unique, you know. Like the New River Gorge has its own, has its own budget assigned to it. I'm talking about the, the bridges that bridge engineers design all day, every day, the ones that are, you know, not unique, the ones that are regular, the one you'll see all the time, so. And in that instance, you got to use your noggin. Um, your engineers. <laughs> the mill out of the viaduct. Yeah, that's a unique one too. Don't don't jump off of it. It's tall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please don't do that with the canoe for you haul. <laughs> There's a, um, there, I don't remember where, there was this, this bridge that got installed. It was like in some rural area, and it was almost like people had installed bleachers and just sat there because the clearance was so low. They just sat there and watched trucks get the top <laughs> sliced off of them. It's so funny. <laughs> there's a place in Tennessee down to the right that was like a whole website dedicated to it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. This is what I'm going to do because we're getting close to ending and we're not going to get too far into this example. We're not leaving just yet. So just. Oh, it'll be okay. I want to see something. Let me see. Uh, Now, I want to show you something. This is example 15A, and we're going to compute the instantaneous live load deflection for this beam. Now, let's see. It's 12 inches wide. It's 17 inches tall. It's 20 inches, or, or 17 inches effective depth, 20 inches total depth, and it has an area of steel of three square inches. Now, if you go to, uh, I believe it's, Example four, that's the exact same beam we did in example four. The exact same beam, okay? So here, here's my point, okay? Let's go back to example four. This is, the, this is example four, okay? All right, and you all got this in your notes somewhere. I know you did because you did it, all right? There's the evidence. Um, in this example, we computed the cracking moment, we computed the gross moment of inertia, and we computed the cracked moment of inertia right here. Y'all remember this? This is the exact same beam that we did in example four. Okay, so this is what I'm gonna ha uh, what we're gonna do. When we come back from spring break, when we come back, we're gonna do this example. But one of the things I'm going to do is I'm just going to say, oh, here's the crack moment inertia, here's the gross moment inertia, here's the cracking moment. And you're going to ask, where did you come up with that? We already did it, okay? So we, we, did, we did this example a while back. My advice to you would be maybe go back through your notes and check that out so that when we come back from spring break, we can hit the ground running. Yeah. <laughs> Bless you. Um, that's pretty, like, <laughs> that's pretty, you know, better to burn out than to fade away way of looking at things. 
I, I hope you make it. I do hope you make that. I got, got, guys, um, so I, I wish everybody a, a very, uh, as relaxing as it can be, spring break. For those of you in ASCE, we're going to have a fun one. <laughs> um, for those of you who's not in ASC, I, 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 I know y'all are packing stuff up. Don't forget, please don't forget that you have a homework due at 2 p.m. on Friday on the card outside my office. Um, if I don't see you between now and the end of this week, I wish you all a very relaxing vacation, and we'll see you when you get back. Oh, goodness. I'll see you all day.